Welcome. This is the September 7th Beehive Call with Andrew, Daniel, Santiago, John, D, John, B, and myself, Michael. Others will hopefully join. And let's see, let's do, dive right in. Andrew, you are having issues on smart, nope, on OmniOS. OmniOS. I caught myself. Uh, regarding 50 VMs on a host and the zone service is timing out after reboot. You've done a proper shutdown, correct? And yes. you're looking for ideas on what might be going on. Has and or how to really fix it. Oh, naturally. I am a prize. Uh, so clean reboot, uh, clean shutdown. And in, you... in, in fairness, I'm fairly sure this is actually specifically a OmniOS problem. I don't doubt that, but the group might have ideas and similar things. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Have you seen this happen with uh, over the years with different, be it strictly zones without Beehive or anything else that made a similar uh, slow start? <sighs> I can't say I have, but by the same token, I also can't say that I've ran any zones at the level that, uh, you know, at the, at the numbers we're talking about. Okay. And from the community experience of yours, have you heard of people proudly bragging about a hundred zones or a thousand zones or some very large number? No, but I mean, there are certainly people who have their ear to the ground better than I do. Mm hmm. What about 50 beehive instances in general? I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever gotten close to that many on a single host. Uh, Once it's up and running, it's fine. Um, during the problem, does it at least bring up any beehive uh, guests or do yes. all of them deadlock? Yes, it does. Bring, it, it will bring a few up depending on what the timeout's set to. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the service time's out and then can, we can turn around and clear the service you... and then it brings up a few more. So wait, you have a single service for all of them instead of, or a That's the way it's set up. So there's the some kind of Beehive manager running as a service. Yeah. Which is a parent process, which then starts all of the uh, zones. Yeah. Okay. Which I think is very much is probably very much the wrong way to do it. Mm, yes and no. It could make sense if you want to turn it into an API. Is that the point. official way? You're just using the official. Um, yeah, that's the, yeah. It just it, it's their official service. What so it starts what? it up. I I know why they. I know why they. I, I get why they do it that way. But I think at scale, it becomes a problem. What's the name of the service? Just for those who want to look closer. Oh, give me a second. I, <laughs> I mean, the service name is like, it's something zone. Um, how long does it take until you time out? Um, I think it's whatever the the default everyone uses is by default. Um, we've tried jacking it up. In this call, it has been mentioned by um, users of Solaris derived operating systems that they always pin the guest memory and differ in how they either pre-reserve it or reserve it at start time, the pinned or wired down uh, host memory. So uh, it could be that just allocating that much riot memory takes a lot of time. Yeah, it could be. And um, also CPU count. How many CPUs? Did you run something on like um, VMstat or Top or the other Solaris tools I'm not familiar with to <laughs> find out what's so busy during this time? Keep in mind that it may be inside the kernel and not visible um, in user space, except for things like D-Trace. I mean, it just, the thing we see going on is 
you know, we see lots of instances of the, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not looking at it right now, but because obviously I'm not experiencing it right now, or I probably wouldn't be on this call. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, we see lots of instances of the zone atom command, which has individual, in, which I believe has individual instance of, instances of it ran one for each zone. So, yeah. Um, well, on a big modern server, having 50 or even 100 virtual machines doesn't sound uh, that unreasonable. I agree unreasonable, with you. Unreasonable, exactly, because that's less than one virtual machine per core, even before hyper threading on a very big server. Well, thankfully, hyper threading is going to go die in a fire. Well, um, Intel's killing it. Are they? Yes, they are. Okay, it's that's... being replaced with uh, their rentable units. It's what they're calling their new technology. Uh, okay. Yeah, the nickel and dime users to death. Right? That is not what that means. No. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's not what that means. No. Um, my understanding is that what it is is they're basically got two cores that have some resources that can be shared. And so normally one will be kind of disabled so that the other one can run faster. It's got more uh, heat and power budget. But if you need more threads, then it will turn the other one on so you can get more threads. So it's just a way of dynamically. Um, so sounds a lot, lot like AMD uh, CMT in the heavy machinery series like Piledriver, Bulldozer, where the floating be. point uh, and vector units where basically the execution units were shared, the instruction caches were um, separate, but the data cache was also shared. Well, we'll see what happens with it. Um, ultimately, it's going to come down to but it really does. I. Yeah. It's one of these cases of I, you know, personally I believe what I can see, as far as what's good and what's bad. Um. But. Okay, so just I'm throwing some questions. Uh, in uh, there, Michael, such as... you, you asked uh, what the service is. The service is a uh, SVC slash system slash zones. Okay, just one Can you throw it into chat? Yeah, please yeah. drop it in there. And I'm putting questions in there such as, is there anything unique about VMs that you notice it's stalling on? Are you hardwiring memory? That might be all the time in Lumos. And also, how many vCPU cores per zone? Because the bring up on that can take time, and that's a test I've been meaning to run for some time. Uh, one fine service. Do, 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 do. Maybe I mean, my understanding is it'll, but... it'll vary depending on zone. Uh, yeah. Well, so so see what's unique that may, you know maybe it's one type of zone that's stalling you out, either a guest OS or a, a storage mm -hmm. emulation type, or you name it. So just try to inventory all that and watch in PR stat and such. Go ahead, Jan. Are there large differences between your guests? Does it always say let this or close to the same point and does the service bring up all guests at once or only a certain number at the same time? Um, so is it... this is the, the, you're asking implementation questions that go deeper sometimes than, that I'm completely solid on. I believe it's at least relatively serialized in how it brings them up. So that makes it even worse. Hmm. Does it bring down the already started guests if the no. later ones fail? No. Okay, so if you just keep uh, re-attempting to bring up the service, it, even, it will eventually work. Into a working system? It will eventually work, but it takes... It ends up taking longer to do that than it takes to do it manually. There's something here that's really wrong. How long are we talking? Like a minute, 10 minutes, an hour? Hours, multiple. Okay, thanks. Yikes. So yeah. you can manually start them up 
kind of no problem, just one after another, or even a bunch in parallel? Um, That's revealing. Yeah, there's something wrong with how this service works. Like I said, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with this service. So I think this may be outside the scope of Beehive itself. Fair enough, but you're bumping into it. Um, have you reached out to Andy or Patrick? Not yet, no. Okay. Um, you know, they may ask some of these same questions. Take notes on all of those and I mean, stay in touch. Well, <laughs> kind of like I said, you know, my thought on the solution here is yeah. that you know, make a make make a milestone for hypervisor running, and then have a separate uh, actual uh, service Can you tell us instance. About milestones. Um. Yeah, they're just like. Uh, I mean, um, it's kind of easiest to think of them as like similar to run levels, except that we're allowed to create them dynamically, so we can create new ones if we want. Um, Similar to the FreeBSD meter services like networking, uh, daemon, exactly systems, exactly it's exactly like that. It's something we it's have like a collection of services with some grouping and error handling policy. From what I remember from reading the design PDF files, got it. Cool. Yeah, it's hmm. not a hardwired. We have this fixed number of targets it's yeah it's more along the lines of of you know any of this stuff that is coming up comes up before this milestone comes up and then you can oh, use okay. that milestone as a dependency for later stuff saying that until this milestone is reached other stuff can't start yeah it's for Got it. sequencing things correctly without prohibiting all concurrency yeah so you know Basically, my thought is right now this is happening as a service that it's trying to start everything and has to do it within the the timeout time frame. And I think that's just not working. And so my thought is so my thought is rather than having a service that does that, you know, basically replace that with a milestone and then have service instances, one for each VM. That are that happened before that milestone hits. Okay, Do you, just as a workaround, is there any way to uh, just say, "Hey, yo, start anything Beehive related last," and just say, "But you know, I don't know if they're using a traditional RC structure or not, but you might they're not. make it last and have a nice day rather than it deciding when and where." Thanks so you no, for it's that. All SMF. Like, um. I mean, basically, the the way the way, uh, the way uh, SMF is structured. Or, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, the, the the service thing is structured is you you put it so that it starts. You know, you've got a dependency on whatever before you need that you need. Well, for instance, are is their stuff dependent on our uh, networking? As in the Beehive emulated networking and other components. Yeah. So, so when when your when your service is starting up, trying to bring up all your VMs, when is it allowed to start running? What is its place? So, Offhand, that is not something I know the answer to. I would have to look at what the pen dependencies are on it. Yeah. All right. You can run the, this, ser the service command has an option to actually spit out the order in which things will start up also. Yeah. Um, sorry, you're not exactly catching me on my, my best day. I need to help. No problem. No problem. <laughs> so, um, so, John, you think on Illumo Solaris, you do get to see how it came up once it's up. What was that last part about either the sequence or showing its state? I, I honestly, I, I, if you're speaking to me, I am not 100% sure. Okay. I have spent very, very little time on there. Okay. I'm just asking if there's a way for him to okay. look at it and determine where it actually is running versus 
where it we think it's running. They may not be the same. All they, it may not be the same. Um, the easy thing I can definitely check is I can see what it depends on. Yes. Maybe. Okay, well, maybe uh, we'll segue to other things and you find out what you can and circle back. Yeah, that's, hope these that's questions fine. Are helpful and feel free to reach out to any of us, you know, between calls and Andy and possibly Patrick. Granted, Patrick's not quite on. Well, I think, no, I think they are on, on, on the other not, but they have their own management tool, which also raises the question, would Propolis help you and not have this problem? his answer might simply be, hey, we solved that. Just that. But didn't we rewrite basically everything? Uh, the user land management front end in Rust. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, is there anything else to mention about uh, Intel hyper-threading? Uh, rentable units, are they truly using a term relating to like... It's a horrible name. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, at least they're not going all the way like IBM with always uh, putting the cores in there and then having you rent them off them. Uh, they mm -hmm. did that at one point already. With Yeah, or with unlockable CPU cores and other features. Yeah, they, they did that uh, with one of, the, one of the early Pentium lines had one that they sold like that. Yeah. Point operated. If I remember correctly, you could unlock the hyper-threading on that one, which is kind of yep. ironic. Yeah, that's true. That is kind of amusing. HPC Wire Intel's rental service on chips could face buyer backlash. I like the sound of that. Okay, cool. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, Santiago, do you have anything to share? It's a loaded question. And you are... Uh, Hello, sorry. Yeah. Hello, don't be. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not not technical. Um, yeah, today we were hit um, with, or today, this week, yeah, we were hit with this bug on the UFI, on the UDK. Um, I think it was upgraded back at this week. And after a reboot, all the VMs started to fail. So they were not booting up the Linux VMs. Um, so I guess just to, answer, to expand on what you put on the on the document, yeah, uh, it was not the management, the people that were asking me to get rid of FreeBSD because the management I will not even care, but it's the engineers that is is even worse. Like people are asking me, hi Santi, that's that's a really cool, yeah, but um, you told us this is rock solid, yeah, and we did a, just an upgrade on a packet, and we reboot and nothing works. So we don't have these problems with Red Hat and Ubuntu, and it's like. Okay, yeah, they got, uh, they have a point there, yeah. So uh, I didn't know what to, <laughs> what to reply. To be honest, um, I, I think we we do have a problem with uh, with QA. Um, if we sum these to the issues with Intel, or, sorry, with B, with Broadcom chips, also when we upgrade to thirteen point two, that after the upgrade, the NICs to stop working. Uh, I guess people are getting fed up. Um, and you know, also Michael, I spoke with some guys from that they are using FreeBSD and Beehive in, in Spain, in Madrid. Uh, one of them, they have a company that they do services with uh, consultancy service on, on FreeBSD. He didn't want to join the call because he his English is it's a bit um, rusty. Uh, but he said also he's he's having the same the same feeling. Yeah, it's getting difficult to justify now um, or to keep justifying why to use. Um, to use FreeBSD because they are having issues also with drivers performance and he was also having issues with the AMD PCI path through. I know that is not important as a technical point of view, but then we are getting a smaller audience. Yeah, um, that is a problem for FreeBSD and Beehive. The PCI Express pass through, are they using AMD Epic uh, Rome? Yeah, well, we, we try on all of them. I have issues on Rome. He has issues on, on uh, Ryzen. Um, I think there are multiple devices affected. Uh, at, at the beginning, I thought it was on, only because, APIC. Uh, 
but this, it seems a bit more. Uh, have been reports on this call uh, about problems with Super Micro AMD Rome boards. That was yeah, it was Santiago. Uh, That's him. Ah, that was Santiago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, is this the correct PR for the EDK two? That's a one for the EDK. Yes. Okay. Where do we? Let's see where we left off on the seventh. Uh, I'd like one simple question. When we're we're referring to the EDK two, you're talking about bringing up your VM with UEFI, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. With UF5, um, when the VM boots, the kernel start complaining. The kernel find APIC, sorry, ACPAs, and then cannot. Uh, in my case, was Red Hat saying that something was timing out. It cannot find blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, Have you then... tried bias boot the VM? So, sorry. Have you attempted a bias boot of the VM using CSM? Because that's pretty much out. The, that's going away. Yeah, but not. No, so yeah, so the the VMs were working like the Red Hat VM was working on one device back. on one, yeah, in one server, and I have to decommission the server because they want to move it to ESX side after all the issues we have with AMD on on Beehive. Yeah. So I said, okay, let me move the VM out to another server, and then you can reinstall that server. Yeah, and then I'm trying to put up that that VM on 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 the other server and it was failing, failing, different different errors. And then I think it was Dan that he was complaining um, on Twitter about having similar issues with Home Assistant, a VM that he was running, that he yeah, was yeah. working, he rebooted and yep. yeah. And then I said, okay, maybe it's the same issue. So I, I rolled back the EDK um, to the previous release and then the VM started working without any issues. You, I, I've kept years of, you know, firmware files, and you definitely want to either snapshot that directory or keep them in a special spot. And, yeah. you know, downgrading is need not be a question of fancy package management. It can be just drag in the file or relink to it. So, well, um, you just point point to it from your command point, exactly from your launch command. Yeah, yeah. Go over there, but. Mm. For me, it's, 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 not, it's more the issues that, or, or the impression that it generates. Yeah? It's like, if we are saying that we are running current and then we have an upgrade that breaks everything, that's fine. But if we are in stable or on a release, not in stable is okay, but in a release, then I think we need to be a bit more careful when we do some upgrades. Um, but it's supposed to work. Uh, sorry? Do we it's supposed to work. Did, do we, did, did anyone yeah, find yeah. the commit that caused the regression? Uh, the bug report I linked to uh, tracks the problem and has identified the reason. Okay. Uh, it's about the ACPI table handling. It used to be that Beehive had hard-coded tables uh, independent of the actual virtual yes. machine configurations. Uh, which were good enough to bring up most of the, the things, and the, but now it limits what you can do going forward. So Beehive has been changed to update these tables, and then to basically write out the tables dynamically before running the firmware to boot the system, to actually reflect the virtual machine configuration. And yeah, but only the latest versions do that. So the new firmware failed on all the release versions of Beehive. Hmm. Mm. Oh, I see. Yeah. No regression testing performed and mm. just committed a port to ports. Yeah. And now, yeah, at least they were quick about it. Yeah, I've not seen this much activity from so many people, from this many people in quite some time. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. The nice thing is that it's only three files you have to get out of a package. Yeah. And they are really just read-only files or a template for the variable file, one of them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really annoying that this happened, but the workaround is easy and... <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, it's... yeah. But yes, it revealed a problem with the process of how all of this is treated. So mm. it's not. Looks like yeah. Um, Corvin Grüne uh, worked on it probably to implement the TPM pass through and other things which depend on this I think because this is needed for Windows bootloader to use the virtualized TPM to ha make Windows 11 happy. But looks like it broke everything on production releases. Yeah. So which... that's Corvin's work that I don't know if he was is the one who did it, but uh, he's one of those who cared about the new feature. Fair enough. And he's doing Which, some of the most heavy lifting in Beehive right now. So there's that. Yeah, but the problem is that it really needs a bit quite a access to physical hardware yeah. to do proper regression testing, mm -hmm. and then you have to automate testing on bare metal. To do all of this regression testing and to do it continuously and make it available to the maintainers of relevant ports, even if they're not committers and stuff like this. Because this is something which, in the case of FreeBSD, should be do done by someone outside of a project, in my opinion. But it can be hard to get someone into the project to do it and to find the resources. Because okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's do some carry forward. Santiago, any news on yes. these two PRs? Um, the X710BA2, oh. and then in general, I know the, the pass through is biting you and others. Um, on the 710, I spoke with Chris. Christoph, Christoph, I don't know how to pronounce it, guys. Christoph, so yes, please correct me. Fine. Christoph, yeah, good. so I sent him yeah an email to his Intel account uh, yeah address, and he said that uh, unfortunately they couldn't include the fix on on the release you know, oh, um, because of corporate blah, blah blah. Yeah, all the corporate you know uh, workflow etc. But he will try to include it on the next one. Um, uh, next release for the first patch level for the what? next. The next release on the Intel ports, yeah. Oh, the, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not a big deal, to be honest. That one. Uh, um, on that very um, note, you one question. Go ahead. Yes. yes. Which may make it less of a production problem, if I remember correctly. On the uh, IXL driver, there aren't just the up to sixty-four virtual functions. The physical function is also always usable as a NIC for the host. So while yes. you can't use the virtual functions, which, yes, it would be nice for, for example, jails, to have the VNet jail use it and a Beehive another one, but at least the host has network access and you can have uh, Beehive guests use them as pass-through devices. So, so can, can you repeat that one? So, what was how, how you do PCI pass through of, of, I mean, of course, without passing the complete port, without having the the SRI OV. I, I didn't follow you on that one. So, if you can explain, um, if you use IOV CTL to configure uh, virtual functions, you don't lose yes. the physical NIC. You gain the virtual functions, and yes, you can correct. configure them. According to this bug report, only all in uh, pass through mode, so the non pass through mode doesn't work, which is a shame because it's very useful for the uh, VNet enabled jails on FreeBSD, mm. which allows them to have n n almost n overhead free network access because you don't do the bridging uh, in s software, but have the NIC perform it. On this next, I think at line rate, or even above. Oh, wait, I don't know if the bug is correct. The issue we're having this one was when you do you create the Sarai OVs, the it crash. It, it makes a kernel panic. That yeah. is, uh, uh, but so you you cannot create anything. Here they are trying to reserve in the example from Finn. 
they're trying to reserve the first virtual function as a non-pass through device. If you uh, look okay. at the we are talking about different no, we're talking about different different bugs, yeah. 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 The Here, share, share saying, yeah. On some NICs, if you enable virtual functions at all, you only have the virtual functions oh, as okay. network interfaces, and you have to reserve one, normally the first one, uh, as non pass through device for the host to have mm -hmm. any access to the NIC for its own networking needs. But on the Intel ones, if I remember correctly, you have the non virtualized device. Correct. Uh, yeah, yeah, correct. And can use it as NIC yes, for the host. That's correct. And so at least you can still use both the host networking and virtualization. So you just can't have this mix and match approach of having, which of course should work and should never panic, but. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the one we were talking with, with Michael says 272828, that it just panics. Um, oh, this one. Okay. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. But it, that, that only happens with the, the one import, with the one in, the thing, yeah, the one imports also you, you don't have netmap and the one on in Canon you have netmap, but. Um, the um, one in ports can have netmap as a compile time option. Yes, I saw that one, yeah, yeah. But are there any advantages from using the one in ports? Because the NIC should be old enough by now that at least 13 dots one and two uh, should have decent enough drivers for it may have caught a snapshot of a less buggy version of the Intel drivers. So how I ended using the one in ports is because the one in kernel was panicking before. Um, oh, nice. IOB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I moved to the to the ports and it was working and then there was an upgrade, uh, a new release that was dot .35, I think, or dot .30, oh. the last release, the minor release, and started to panic. But the, I, I think one of the, the I don't know, you guys can explain better the difference here, yeah? but what is the one import is not using if live and the one in kernel is using if live. I don't know if there are more, what, which one is, if there is any benefit on it. Or I have lib is... as an API inside hmm. FreeBSD to move, to remove uh, code applications from drivers yeah, so that common promise. driver operations are uh, done in a common library instead of uh, having every driver do it itself. Yeah. Mm. Um, the advantage is when done correctly, it keeps the driver smaller and l has less error-prone code uh, okay. in each driver, which is mostly uh, cargo culted from whichever driver the developer of the driver you're using, like before, mm. or okay. on similar hardware. And sometimes things get improved in one, in, uh, one driver and not copy and paste it everywhere. Whereas with gotcha. a yeah. single uh, implementations of things like uh, bringing an interface up and down, draining the queues if you uh, mm. logically de destroy an interface and stuff, there are fewer mm. cases where you can have errors. Okay. Mm. And the network stack gets uh, a bit decoupled because the drivers aren't directly... Um, I'm messing around in the kernel network stack structs, but call functions on them, or at, at least macros, which gives better compatibility because the kernel only has to preserve the interface and not all implementation details. The downside is that some drivers did quite clever things in their copy of this code, uh, which uh, at least in the beginning, IF Lab did not all support. So some drivers lost a bit of the, especially um, packets per second throughput because mm. some optimizations were lacking in IF Lib or couldn't be expressed through the interface. Mm. At least initially, the interface has become a bit richer. Okay. And the drivers have been rewritten to follow the threading model, the kernel recommends instead of doing supposedly clever things. <laughs> mm, Too clever so by yeah. half. <laughs> Too clever by half. Some of them. Oh, that's really cool thing largely for, for settled the on IFLIP because yeah. it was a little bumpy at first. Yeah. 
So one of the reasons why people dislike the F-Lab is that it requires touching drivers, which right now worked. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. And we have to at least to get most of the benefits out of having this abstraction. Because if you once upon once somewhere in the future get to a point where you can make this the only way of doing it and remove the old uh, interfaces, which are then you unlock new capabilities. And the other reason, which is why people like um, Juniper were interested in pushing this is that it allows their quite far diverged uh, the network stack to uh, consume IFLib drivers, giving them access to FreeBSD drivers for new hardware. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, despite them having changed quite a few things in their network stack to support things FreeBSD's network stack can't do. Okay. So thanks a lot for that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great, great um, explanation. Uh, it, some, uh, it's my impression from the mailing list discussion I loosely followed around the time that some of the driver maintainers and the FreeBSD kernel networks that were a bit uh, peeved that they felt this was pushed from outside the project be to benefit someone else. But there were also people from inside FreeBSD wanting to not duplicate all of this annoying code for every new little driver they wanted yep, to yeah. support. Hmm. So yeah, yeah but okay. the ones working on their one or two very similar latest and generation before, uh, let's say, 40 and 100 gig or 100 and 200 gig NICs weren't really interested in supporting 95% of the network cards, but cared only about two models or something, where the de mm -hmm. duplication of code didn't hurt them because they only had their two very well-optimized copies of the code Okay. to think about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, moving on, anything new on the various PCI pass-through issues, particularly on AMD, which I believe was this one? No, not really. Um, and and I know you. this was also on Red Hat, if I'm not mistaken. It seems to be a firmware issue on Supermicro hardware. Is that accurate? Yeah. Look, last, Diago... last week I break. Yeah, yeah sure, sorry. Did you uh, mm -hmm. try to update both oh. the BMC firmware and the uh, UEFI firmware? Yes, I break almost break one of the Lenovo servers last week, but I managed to recover oh. it. Yeah. Okay. Wait, um, Lenovo's in <laughs> is. Uh, has the same I have the issue on both. I have this. Yeah, the Lenovo is doing the same, the same okay. problem. It took hmm. also a lot of time. It's not it's not crashing like the supermicro. The supermicro gets like completely stupid, and then the NVMe it cannot reach the NVMe anymore, and then it reboots. Yeah. Uh, the supermicro still rock solid. I mean, it starts showing messages like, uh, "I cannot uh, this command um, cannot be finished. This command cannot be finished," and a lot of errors. But the server stays, stays working. The, the supermicro mm. goes bananas. Yeah. Of course, FreeBSD will either hang or panic or some question some other way if you remove uh, file, uh, the mounted file systems and their yeah, backing exactly. block yeah, devices. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can unload the system except for a torture load uh, and use things other than file systems to reproduce it, let's say ChemDD and the NVD driver, uh, sorry, NDA driver, hmm. uh, in, the, in that case, you could boot off either a tempfs or um, MDMFS or other things, hmm. maybe netboot or just put in a USB drive. The worst solution would be to boot from network storage via, uh, via the BMC, but that's so painfully slow that I would yeah, only use it to... Boot a very minimal system, create an MD device, and reroute the system to the MD device. Hmm. So uh, that's uh, one way, because I assume you have 
16 gigs but of also, RAM you know, for the root file system. So Sometimes it's just disconnect, like it, it loses also connectivity. It, that, that server has a Broadcom card, and mm -hmm. then it has a, an Intel. And like, if I, it doesn't matter what I try to pass to pass through, if it's a mm -hmm. NIC or a, whatever, then I lose connectivity to the NIC cards. So okay. <laughs> all the PCI devices goes bananas. Yeah. Um, depending on the exact BMC, you may be able to have the BMC act as USB Ethernet. Oh dear. Hmm. Okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, generic yeah. USB CDC with a generic yeah. driver okay. so that Clever. you have an Clever. out of band Ethernet tunnel. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's. Have we seen any yeah. movement from the hardware vendors on at least acknowledging it? No. Okay. No, no. Has anyone looked into the quirks and uh, workarounds uh, Linux has to cope with this because uh, the, it looks like Linux encounter similar problems and there are well, solutions. There was the Red Hat PR that's open, but it's only visible with an account. So the resolution update the BIOS, but Santiago, I trust you tried that 173. Yeah, but they do two things update BIOS, but I think that's by default that they always yeah. said. And then all of them, they do the IOMMU uh, equals PT. Uh, I don't know. I didn't check on Linux what it means. Um, but... Can you uh, put the, just that detail into the document or the chat? I, which one? The, the PR? IOMMU equals oh, yeah. what? There it goes. Yeah, look. Equals oh. pass through. Yeah, IOMMU, exactly. Okay. You know, John, uh, at some point they said, somebody said, um, this only happens when you have a SATA drive. I was like, okay, I went to BIOS, disable everything SATA. I boot the server and it was like, yeah, rock solid for X amounts of hours. I was going to tell Michael, mm -hmm. I got it. And then it crashed. Crash. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> again. Um, these uh, <sighs> Epic CPUs have some of their. Uh, I O pins, which can be basically they have generic SATA lanes and they can be configured as either SATA, I think in theory is SAS and uh, PCI Express. So there hmm. may be settings hidden in the BIOS to remap this, or if you're unlucky, maybe a jumper to really get rid of it. Or if you're lucky, it's okay. only to change your default behavior. Yeah. It could be that it's only a problem if you use the. Uh, Maybe if you have ports mapped at all, because then there is an AHCI, which is a PCI Express function, which I'm maybe so the buggy a, one. A setting or jumper to change what? Uh, uh, BIOS or these days EFI uh, setting uh, okay. to change the allocation of the I.O. lanes the CPU has. So the Epic okay. CPUs have tons of I.O. Yep. pins. Uh, and some of them can be configured as either SATA or PCI Express. This is often that, for example, on the super micro boards, some, uh, you have to pick between the maximum number of SATA lanes uh, or uh, additional CU link or whatever C uh, PCI Express over some kind of uh, cable extension. Mm. Interesting. Mm. So, for example, if you the on motherboard um, U.3 connectors or something may be you have to pick and choose if you want to use them then you can't use it or stuff like this because you have only a finite number of pins you can remap hey, some boards allow you to do to it that. in uh, software some have a hardware jumper which is a bit old fashioned <laughs> Yeah, but it's your boot device, and yeah, I can also understand at least to have the default via a jumper, because you really don't want to have the someone unplug the BIOS battery, plug it back in, and suddenly your NVMe storage is unreachable because yeah. your mainboard tries to talk SATA to it, yeah, or talk SATA on other pins which are routed through a MAX and suddenly dead. Yeah. yeah, for for me to be honest, it's more something uh, something that I don't know. 
outside the hub or something is not doing correct when it, when it's passing. Of the course, devices. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it may be that certain combinations of features are impossible in hardware, and the software is supposed to catch these. Hmm. But what's strange is that it's not either broken or working, but that it works for a while and then hmm, breaks correct, down. Yeah. Unusual. Yeah, correct. yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. really the worrying, yeah. most worrying detail because all of this is happening around I.O. and memory mapped I.O., so potentially hmm. arbitrary physical memory corruption, which is how you shred file systems. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please see. Don't go there. <laughs> the only uh, way I've ever lost uh, a ZFS pool to a software bug was a driver bug in a wireless card because I... Uh, what I did is I put a wireless card in to my my home server for to rewire it and keep it online. And what then happened was that this stupid little Ateos Wi-Fi card didn't support truly support 64-bit DMA and swapped the 32-bit halves of the physical address. Mm. And just DMA'd random crap all over physical yeah. memory. And Ow. after ZFS had checked the data, <laughs> and great. once I looked at the disk, at the beginning of my disk, uh, I found lots of Ethernet frames there on my disk. All over the ZFS data structure, suddenly I saw I, uh, Ethernet headers followed by IP headers. Uh. And... Because of course, it only Sorry, nothing because computes the checksum once. <laughs> make, says that it has computed the checksum, and yeah. then DMA is the good copy for, of its ECC protected memory oh, boy. to each mirror of without recomputing the checksum for every mirror because it has a few milliseconds ago computed the checksum. Yeah, and yeah, of course, <laughs> the the other kernel. Code is blameless. It's just, yeah, the stupid hardware has an errata if you enable uh, above fee four gigabyte decoding and mm. use. Yeah, it just shreds everything. Ah, oh, charming. Okay. On that happy note, is anyone using OpenStack? A colleague was in form that they might be using a whole bunch of OpenStack and Jails and Beehive if we can get things like Nix to work and the EDK data to work. Um, and it sounds like Lee Wen is maintaining the package. Oh, he's working on porting, yeah, the compute right to, to Beehive, right? Uh, maybe so. Does but, anyone yeah. recall a presentation or otherwise? I remember, yeah. Mm. So to answer your question, Michael, yes, um, I happen to have some OpenStack, but I do not use it with FreeBSD. I've been unable to, to bring any of the, the FreeBSD side stuff online and prove that it's stable. Is it something you are desiring to do? Not at this time. Okay. Looking for critical mass here, uh, operating systems. And I'm looking at the port, but OpenStack only brings up some support components. Let's see. OK, noted. Um, and he will be at your OBSDCon. Speaking of which, it sounds like a few of us will be there. Um, I would like BeehiveCon to be rather hands-on for be it mapping out what regression testing looks like or testing these actual PRs if there are any that are still lacking workarounds and other topics that you are about to belt out right now. And I have a few ideas of people who should. So, uh, just a few minutes ago, 
Yep. Someone commented that uh, adding the dash uppercase A flag to Beehive uh, command line is also enough to uh, get it to boot. I repeat that. With so the for, for the uh, firmware. Regarding the EFI uh, firmware? Yes. Uh, oh. uh, generate ACPI tables. That should be the, a default flag. Yeah. Which flag? At least to... uppercase A. A. Uh, dash uppercase alpha. Um, mm, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna try it now. That's a classic. I'm gonna yeah. Go, yeah, I'm gonna go to the new one. Uh, I believe that was always great. needed for free BSD, correct? Yeah. I'm checking. I thought it was by push by default. I'm using BM behind. I thought it was by default. It was doing minus A, but I think I'm wrong because I cannot see it on the options. Thank you for that link, Jan. That's informative, I trust. Let's see. Do, do you guys know if somebody's working on on the virtual net to get like uh, multiple queues support? So on uh, yeah, on virtual net. Hmm? I'm not going to build it anytime soon. I, I just want to have Chris up there, so at least we can talk architecture. So. Um, the fastest thing we can get, which isn't tied to uh, SRIOV, would be to um, have well tested multi queue netmap support because the theory the netmap stuff is already supports a bunch of offloading, and hmm. netmap itself is inherently batched in multi queue. So, what you want, but the packet. What happens is to move packets, yeah. um, you take a VM exit into uh, go into the Beehive process on the host, and then mm -hmm. it does uh, a mem copy between the memory mapped uh, netmap ring buffer and the vidIO ring buffer. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, just a mem copy call per direction to move the data from one one ring buffer to the other, and then ring the doorbell register or virtual. Yeah global register. And what we would need is to not take the VM exit and perfectly kind of similar to interrupt um, rate limiting to limit how many batches are processed, but also limit how large a single batch can grow and how long we wait <clears throat> to collect the batch. All of this is how actual physical network cards have to be talked to by their driver. So the code exists, but what uh, doesn't exist is the logic tying it all into there. And then we need to raise some of the limits around veil. So the number of veil bridges yeah. you can have and or make it, uh, the best would be to have it be clonable so that they implicitly get created when you start using them. Hmm. And mm. so, but one question: this, because I remember you you mentioned at some point that it was breaking. They were breaking. Um, yeah, that was in was twelve. Crashing. I haven't immediately crashed uh, in thirteen, but I haven't done a lot of testing. Okay, in I, 12, I use it uh, just for two and three. It was an yeah. almost immediate kernel panic generator on the hardware I paired it okay. with. Yeah, basically create a veil port, connect Beehive to it. Yeah, and uh, wait a few seconds, and you're sitting at a kernel panic. Really, with, with the kernel trying to dereference some unmapped memory. Okay. So, uh, but you're that was between two VMs in the kernel memory correction. Jump, that mark. was between two VMs on the same machine, or you were doing um, also with an external port. I I didn't even have to put load on it. Really? Just uh, the normal background traffic in my home network was probably enough. Wow, okay. So it, I really meant it when I said it was a reliable kernel panic generator. You don't yeah, have to yeah. set the CTL for it to raise a panic. You can just use Veil. Mm. Um, but on 13, that looks like this bug has been fixed. Okay. Uh, I've tested it. 
performance was better for the, than the routed stuff, but not by that much because it's still only a more efficient single queue. Hmm. And it's still not as efficient as it should be because what we have is, uh, and what we should keep is that the Beehive user space process does all the negotiation with the guest driver to make it appear as a VIRT.io net device. Hmm. But the next problem is what it should then do is support multi-queue on that, but it also should uh, have kernel support to handle the movement of data between the ring buffers. I don't suppose it's possible to use the same backing memory if we could get there. That would be glorious, but I don't think hmm. uh, we, we should shoot for the moon to have a zero copy operation where the guest map memory is to immediately used as net map queue. Okay. But if uh -huh. the format can be made compatible, that would be ideal because then you can save one copy. But the most important part is probably to uh, not take the VM exit and full round trip to user space, but only take an occasional VM exit for once per batch and do the copy in the kernel. Because once all the ring buffers are set up, doing mem copy between ring buffers, that's not really that much logic. Okay. Anything unusual can still be punted up to the user space process. Okay. Anything else on that topic? Because, hey, I see activity from Bjorn as we speak on Jan, your tap re regression. If we're gonna yeah, we're look into your IRC client. Yes, sir. So the big <laughs> red one. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Big red one? I, uh, my client gives a little red one for a new uh, yeah, um, connection. Uh, Santiago, see you in a, I don't know, a few days. <laughs> yeah, see you in Portugal, guys. Awesome. Super. Take care. Take care. Safe travels, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. So let's see. The Zebster. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully between you two, we can get a fix and get it into 14. At least he's... So um, the problem is uh, how I those. read uh, his response between the lines is that he wants pr to preserve as much of the code as possible, mm -hmm. even if the patch is roughly the same size and the code left in place is harder to read, performs more system calls and resource allocations, has more failure cases, but it looks closer to what was there before. Yeah. And just uh, his untested patch does not fix the problem. Oh boy. It only allows Beehive to ignore the problem and start. Okay. But this means that Beehive, you, if you apply his patch, Beehive won't... Um, bring up the tab or the mnet interface uh, on its own if you don't set the sysctl to have it come out automatically on open. So it depends on this global sysctl. And if you have anything depending on it being zero instead of one, you're out of luck. Okay. Yeah, but if you don't need it, which normally you don't, so you can always set the sysctl to uh, one instead of the default of zero then uh, skipping over it isn't elegant, but still works. I would prefer if he can, uh, um, green lights my idea of replacing the unnecessary indirection of creating an IP socket, either IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, and before the code, if it couldn't create either, it would just refuse to start with his Untested patch, it at least only warns and uh, closes the socket if the ioctal on the socket failed and then gives up and lets Beehive run in whatever state it finds the tab interface in. Which, um, yeah, if you have it come up automatically on open, then it works. 
it will you will just get a spurious confusing warning about could not open socket and everything mm -hmm. still works. Uh, if you don't have this CTL to set, the tab interface will stay down and you have to build some annoying polling logic because there are no events you can subscribe to to get it without polling uh, because the interface is created and then it stays down and you have to wait for a beehive to open the device mm -hmm. and only once a PID is registered as the one and only opener of this top device at a time should you set the top interface up. But you okay. can't ping a polyp so slowly that the guest uh, gets confused because its virtualized network isn't connected because the top device is uh, logical link state down. Yeah. So um, in my opinion, this just... So to support this, which was supported beforehand, Yeah. Uh, we should just use the code which works in all cases. And from my understanding of the kernel tab driver, the IOCTL I'm invoking on, on it can't fail if you have a valid file descriptor for a tab. So in theory, you could even uh, ignore the return value. And because the IOCTL um, implementations defaults to always setting the um, interface up flag, even if you haven't asked for it, because it infers this, because that's supposedly what once upon a time the VMware runner on FreeBSD did. Mm -hmm. Because this, all of this VMIO stuff is for VMware from okay. the bad old times. Have you noticed but that it's... he'll be in Portugal? I don't know if he will be there. Okay. Uh, so... I saw... But I only infer that it look I or I only assume that he because it's a bug fix he wants to change as little as possible yeah but if he only turns the failure from fatal into a warning mm. beehive starts yeah the code remains all of, retains all of the complexity uh, which isn't needed and it still does not work in all host configurations inside jail but hmm. yeah, so well, it's I hope that not ideal. Use and is constructive. But um, I hope that um, I can press right and the fair argument I put in the comment number six. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm waiting well, for his response. Excellent. And thanks for pursuing that and posting your. And it's the patch is tiny. On. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, and the resulting code is even sm smaller yep. because it only it basically removes unnecessary indirections. Yep, elegant. That's, elegant. That's all. Uh... Okay. So that said, um, I think Santiago and I will do our best to have our right our now? labs online for BeehiveCon. So if you have any remote resources, you can spin up. Great, consider um, it. Go ahead, Jan. So what you can do right now is to have a, a VNet enabled jail with only a loopback interface. Right. If you want to isolate Beehive, but it's still a larger IP uh, attack surface because the, while it's uh, virtualized through v VNet, um, it still has access to an IP stack, even if mm -hmm. it's not connected to the outside world. So the process still has a larger attack surface to attack uh, on the system call level. Yep, yep, yep. Because yep. if all of the IP-related system calls fail because you can't create new sockets, and without yep. sockets, you can't do anything yep. to attack the IP stack. Okay, yep. Well, thank you for pursuing that. I'm glad he's interactive. Hopefully, we'll get a resolution to it. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Jan? On that good work, um, I'll say. I hope that I will have my FreeBSD 14 include maze ready to yep. have a jail.conf start beehive with oh, includes yeah. and stuff. Did was there anything since the, yesterday's call on the uh jail like base config file? Um, we look at the comments I put in the document. Uh, 
yesterday. Uh, um, fixed up your notes on what I said. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. I saw that late yesterday. Basically, uh, what I suggested was to add in the call, I suggested to add um, a second uh, include directive, which would include jails and infer the jail name from the included files base name. So it would basically remove the directory part, keep only the file name, remove the .conf suffix and use the resulting base name as a jail name. Yep. But um, since Jamie mentioned that he wants to make um, variables available to uh, places they are not yet usable in. Yep. Another um, probably That's more elegant easy. solution would be to have uh, the include uh, the jail block definition either expand variables in the jail name mm -hmm. and make the base name after stripping available as a variable or um, to um, have a special token to reference to the okay. base name which uh, I think I use percent uh, current percent or something in the Pseudo did, code. Did that make it into a PR at all? No, not at all. And this because guy, it will definitely right? not make it. I mean, in, yeah, this idea. It's something which is right now a syntax error or something, so that you could just have the idea here is that then that you can uh include this same file multiple times under different soft or hard links okay. and have it include the jail block so you don't have to have a special include directive because the included file will already define its own jail but i also uh, annotated that this looks um like um slowly uh Feature by feature, we implementing libucl in a comment because that's slowly what we're doing. Yes, in a way compatible to the existing jail.conf. But maybe having jail.conf accept files ending in .ucl uh, as UCL configuration hmm. would be the better solution. Hmm. Okay. Just if you name your it, etc jail.ucl, it prefers that over jail.conf. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. And it would okay. just default, or it would try to parse it as a, a UCL file. And if it does not pass, then it tries the old parser or something. Yep. Backward compatible. Okay. But I would just have it if it's if the file name ends in .ucl, it invokes a UCL parser. Interesting. Okay. I like it. I like it. Mm, it's already there in base. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it has lots of funky templating stuff in there. Hmm. Uh, we can just have the jail command add a few maybe jail specific macros because you can an application using libucl can create a parser and then register callbacks for its own macros to do higher level stuff. Okay. So that you don't have to type out annoying things. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. Okay. But that's okay. all jail specific and not uh, Beehive. True, specific. but it's a beautiful segue back to Andrew on those 50 VMs not coming up. Did you have a chance to explore anything else while we've been talking? Um, I don't know what else to explore. Mm. Um, what you could explore? If you can uh, afford to bring the system up and down, no, I <laughs> yeah, <cannot>. exactly. <clears throat> I mean, if it, it's got fifty VMs have... because it's in production, so do you yeah, have any test maybe... systems that can simulate it to some degree? With, I can uh, probably forty VMs. <laughs> I can 25? probably put something together to test it, mm -hmm. and I mean, even if I go about attempting to implement my you know the solution I thought of. I'll have to because mm -hmm. I can't. I can't test this on a production can't machine. Experiment in production. Nope. Well, uh, everyone has a test uh, environment. A few lucky ones have a separate production environment. <laughs> yes, sir. 
Um, at least when it comes to it. But uh, joking aside, uh, it sounds like you're really facing an operating system specific uh, yeah, service management problem and mm. not necessarily an underlay beehive or VMM problem with your user space or kernel side half of a hypervisor, but it could be anything service related. You really... Yeah, I think it's, I, I, I really do think it's... Get in touch with someone very familiar with how the service management on your Illumo S variant works. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I really do think it's very um, OmniOS specific and how they chose okay. to uh, get start in touch things with, up. Um, the, the... It could be, it, it could be upstream Illumo but I'm not sure. But, but it sounds like you have to get in touch with thing. OmniOS. Uh, Operators and developers. My, uh, my, my, my uh, thought about what to deal with on this or how to deal with this best is to probably see if my idea for how to fix it fixes it, and then start talking to upstream yeah. to see if so better approaches can be done on a lot less. Um, Troublesome scale. I've encountered some other problems if you create a Beehive cast on your FreeBSD laptop or something like this. And this can really basically almost hang the systems for up to 30 seconds or so while all of the memory pressure is resolved by evicting cache to disk uh, or shrinking caches and discarding uh, discardable cached content. And while this happens, lots of things block because they're waiting for the memory pressure to go down to reasonable levels. Yeah, this problem, that, that type of thing is what pretty much what I'm expecting is going on. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of what happens when you ask your laptop running bloated uh, desktop software, Chrome, Thunderbird, probably two other WebKit uh, forks. Uh, in electron or other form, if you ask it to find half of its physical memory to map to a virtual machine, and it has to clean up, then yeah, it's busy swapping to its single SSD. Um, I don't know if Illumo S does it the same way, but um, one of the problems I've encountered on FreeBSD on big systems is that at least on FreeBSD, and I assume because it was ported from Solaris there as well, um, the ZFS arc is not NUMA aware. Mm -hmm. Which means if the other memory allocators are, which I kind of hope they are, a problem can be that some kernel subsystems say, no, there is no memory pressure because um, well, there's things, things there is aren't because it rare because you have tens of gigabytes of really free memory distributed over but all But it's on the wrong, yeah, it's on the wrong demand. Yeah, and because of that, uh, I've seen it on FreeBSD where uh, ZFS will say, yeah, it's nice of the kernel to ask me to... Uh, release memory, but why should I shrink the arc by any relevant amount? Because there's like 40 gigs of free memory on the system and it only has like a quarter of a terabyte. So it's not really under memory pressure, right? And at the same time, you can have, uh, if I encountered this when one of my uh, DIMMs wasn't uh, securely seated and suddenly one uh, NUMA domain had only uh, one of its two DINs show up, hmm. uh, which uh, of course is a terribly unbalanced uh, NUMA setup if you have four domains and one of them is only half the size of the others. Uh, and this domain had only a few tens of megabytes of free memory, which in FreeBSD triggered really pathological behavior where the kernel would uh, not just demand page out some pages, but would really hard swap whole processes and would refuse to page in a single page of them 
uh, which can happen to your login shell while you run top and then you exit top <laughs> and the okay. kernel will refuse to page in you completely swapped out uh login shell Goodness. so basically the shell and everything works and then processes just stop getting scheduled because we're blocking on page ins and the memory subsystem refuses to page this completely swapped out process because even the processes which are at least partly in core uh, are already under terrible memory pressure because there's one NUMA domain which is almost completely uh, empty. Uh, sorry, completely full. And yeah, on the system until I, uh, the only solution to get it stable and this until I could replace the um, them was to um, bad memory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, turns out the memory was wasn't just not con uh, locked in on one side, but also damaged. Um, well, that's bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it had produced lots of ECC errors. Mm. So it was detected afterward, but it's not fun if you have like several correctable ECC uh, errors a second. Mm. So I had to run it with Numa disabled, which cost me like 10, 15% of make build world throughput, but better than not having the system. Mm -hmm. So anything else or shall we call it good and see perhaps each other next week? Yeah. In some cases. When do you arrive? Uh, uh, maybe... I arrive in... Lisbon on Sunday, I believe, and then oh, the week before Monday, a few days before. Um, I have that right here handy. Let me see. Anyhow, that need not worry our listeners. So when uh, do you have a link to what's scheduled for Beehive Conf and where? No, I'm thinking I'll do an introduction. I haven't heard a room number because yet, but we will then we just pair up in groups and discuss what we want to address and come back. And to the very which days do we have the room for? for? Uh, that's just Friday. So we can get some benefit of the Dev Summit and then... So um, only the 15th. Correct, only the 15th. So okay. I think I'll be... On the late the eleventh in Coimbra. So, anything else? If not, I'm going to call it at eleven twenty a.m. Pacific. Yeah. So, Andrew, do keep us posted. If you can serialize that startup, that is great. And it, if it's to work around, and you have to manually launch everything, and it works well, it's working. Uh, if no, not, it's you not. Reach out to Andy, and I, I hope you find an answer. Come on, putting something into etc rc dot local or equivalents or an at reboot cron job something isn't the solution. No, <laughs> but if it gets them up and running and doesn't get them yelled at, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, it kind um, it, it it kind of is because what I think is going on is I think the problem is that there's no way really for the process to go tell the the startup that yes i'm making progress even though this is taking forever mm -hmm. and so it's just got a value that it kills it after and so when you start to get to high numbers of vms that's just not reasonable anymore mm 